Brilliant system here, spreading the feed on the manure. Does that seem gross to some of you? <laughs> no, it's not, it's not. Remember, they're dinosaurs, they love that stuff. <laughs> we get mobbed by them every time we come out. <laughs> Everyone, this is Matt, and we are at ABC Acres in Montana. Welcome Where to Montana. We? <laughs> Hamilton, Montana. You from Montana? No, sir. I'm from Colorado. Oh, boy. Yeah. What brought you to Montana? ABC Acres. Okay. Uh -huh. And, you know, uh, slightly less people than okay. Colorado. Uh, okay. How many, how many less people? There's a million people in Montana. Do you know how many are in Colorado? I don't know how many are in Colorado. I know that there are more <laughs> cows than people in Montana, which uh, is kind of exciting. You're in the right place, buddy. Yeah. What are you, the Pied Piper? These chickens are following you. I think it's you. You're, you're permaculture <laughs> chicken. So, being, we try and encourage them to stay roughly three days behind the cattle. We don't use any electric net fed fencing or anything, so they really go wherever the heck they want. But we go to three days behind the cattle and we actually spread their grain out in the cow pots. This is hot. And let them have at it. <laughs> Try to encourage the spreading of the manure and break pest cycles. Once you've thrown a few handfuls out, you're not going to trip on a chicken. You might. <laughs> <laughs> and for those who don't know, he's throwing it on the manure so that then they will spread it, that it more evenly fertilize it. Yeah. And how does it break down the uh, well, pest cycle? We find in our climate, day three is uh, when the fly larvae are emerging um, and the dung beetles have done their work. Sometimes they get into it while the dung beetles are still in it. We lose some dung beetles, but um, we try and encourage them to eat as much fly larvae as possible. And, it seems to, they seem to do a pretty good job because I've seen a lot of cattle herds that have way worse fly pressure mm. than ours does. You're always going to have them. I mean, would your viewers be offended if we looked at fly larvae? No, go ahead. We love to be messing around in manure. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a dung beetle. Dung, dung beetle. Why are dung beetles so important? Oh, they help incorporate. See, there's some fly Ooh. larvae right in there. We want the chickens to eat them, but not the dung beetles. Because the dung beetles, they'll bring the actual manure down into the soil where they live, and that's where they feast on it. Um, so, like, this is a path that you probably don't want the chickens in until tomorrow, but. They're not going to eat all the dung beetles. The dung beetles will survive as a species. They're going to do a lot better than our neighbors who are worming their cattle. Um, but if we can get as many of those fly larvae eaten before they become flies, that's awesome. You guys are the ones giving the chickens the fly larvae. Brilliant system here, spreading the feed on the manure. Does that seem gross to some of you? <laughs> no, it's not, it's not. Remember, they're dinosaurs, they love that stuff. Grains, they love it. Grains on top of manure, even better. And then they find a nice surprise of a <laughs> nice juicy <laughs> fly larva. They're in heaven. Those dinos have gone to heaven. These, these, these cows have died and gone to heaven. They're getting moved every day. In the morning, we're gonna do that tomorrow morning. Paddock system. See some more chickens. We got some pigs. <laughs> Told you that girl had devil eyes. 
Don't turn your back. <laughs> They're actually pretty sweet for goats. <laughs> for goats, he said. He qualified it. Did you hear that? He qualified it. Pretty sweet for goats. Hey, stay up. So this is Kevin Bacon, our Cooney Cooney <laughs> boar, and our two female does that were born this spring in March. They're all hanging out together right behind them. So next week they will rotate into here. That's Patsy Swan. She's due to Pharaoh any day now. You can see her belly's hanging real low. Um, and he gets just a little bit of soaked grain because we're trying to encourage him to eat his vegetables. <laughs> and you can tell he's really well fed. So going short on him for the grain. So that yeah. he it. You guys have planted kale yeah, it's and grasses and what else? Brassicas, um, there's daikon, turnips, kale. Um, there's generally, it looks like the goats ate all the sunflowers. Um, and all the tree boxes to keep the trees safe, we have uh, Jerusalem artichokes or sunchokes that we'll pull out for the pigs when they're ready. Um, basically, we go in, you know, when we move the pigs weekly, we go into our seed storage and grab a handful of everything. Oh. So at least 10 to 12 different varieties. So. You throw it in after they left? Yeah. Um, what? We would do it, you know, sometimes if we don't, we, the chickens aren't always part of the system. Um, so we'll throw it in when the pigs are in there sometimes, so they work it into the soil. But with the chickens following our other group of pigs, we do it once the chickens have left the area, so the chickens just aren't eating. Kevin, you get along with those goats? Do they have devil eyes? They like to jump on us. <laughs> they jump on you? Look at this beautiful system. Lots of green grass he's getting ready to move into. Kevin, you got it made, buddy. And I guess these are permanent. Yes. You never have to build it again. Just no. maintain it and just move them around. How do you herd them from one spot to the other? Well, there's gates in every corner. So, uh, you know, pigs being pigs, they'll follow a bucket of feed pretty much anywhere. <laughs> uh, but it's really just a matter of opening a gate and calling them through. Why Cooney Cooney? Um, well, our other pigs are large black mixes. And this is, uh, these guys are, she's just 15 months old now, so this will be her first litter. Um, we're really excited for it, but uh, all the counts say that Coonies do better on a forage-based diet, whereas your larger, more bacon type, or even, you know, your, your bigger, tr more traditional, even if they're heritage pigs, they're, they're grain intensive. Um, they'll do well with low grain diets, but if you're doing them for production, it's just, you know, take two years on a forage based diet to get a 200 pound pig. These guys are always going to be smaller, but they seem to do a lot better with minimal grains. So you can see the sun chokes growing in that tree box where the goats have nibbled everything they can get. Okay. But you know, next time the pigs are in there, we'll probably just hop in there and toss them some artichokes. What made you think to run goats and pigs together? Uh, why not? <laughs> uh, they, they eat slightly different things. Uh, from what I've seen in previous uh, farms, uh, pigs do really well either following or with ruminants. And um, around here, we don't want the pigs out in our nice cattle pastures, and goats really don't care how rough the terrain is, so they mix really well together. And these are our large black mixes. These are all, all ladies. And why directly on the ground? Pigs don't eat out of troughs in nature. We might lose some feed this way, or lose, but you know, soil microorganisms or birds or chickens will eat it. And the organic matter is not going anywhere. So you can tell these girls are plenty healthy. If they were starving, they wouldn't let they eat the chickens. <laughs> <laughs> so where do these chickens fit into all this? 
Uh, similar to the chickens following the cows, they're the, the cleanup crew. They're, they're helping spread any of the goat or pig manure. Help break up the parasite cycles by doing so and eating any of the bugs that are in the pig or goat manure. If you've ever raised goats or sheep, you'll know that as far as parasite resistance goes, they're a lot weaker than cattle. Uh, so having someone to help break the pest cycle helps a lot. And also, you know, the pigs are pretty good rooters, but once they've loosened up the soil and the chickens come in, this was a big hole before the chickens got here and they've been scratching around and kind of filled it back in for us. Um, so now I don't have to come in with a rake and level it out. We're not shooting for, for uh, you know, putting greens around here, but we also don't want super deep wallows. Do you irrigate? Uh, yes. It's, uh, I'm not going to say it's mandatory around here in Montana, but our our average precipitation here in the Bitterroot Valley is 12 inches of rainfall and 80% of that comes in snow in the form of snowfall during the winter. So you can raise everything we are raising without irrigation, but it takes about five times the acreage. Because once you graze something without the irrigation, it's done till next season. There's no no recovery, whereas what the cattle are on right now this is their second pass through the tree belt paddocks um, and the pasture behind me that is being irrigated right here there's a high likelihood that they will actually graze it a third time this season where nice. if we weren't um, if we weren't <laughs> irrigating it just wouldn't be an option so, um, we graze it once and we'd be done and that house is the right size to get through this gate to go to the next paddock. It's designed to go, this coop is designed to work with this paddock. Are you pulling that by hand? Yeah. Nice. It, it takes All by two yourself? Of us. It takes two of us. Okay. If it was totally flat ground, you could pull it by yourself. Um, and it's actually due for cleaning tomorrow, but basically to clean it out. These drop down, we can put a rake in, pull all the bedding out, spread it wherever we need it. Ah. We just drop. So you capture it, it doesn't fall through. No. You capture it and then you can put it where you want. Yep. So we'll draw, oh, we gotta refill all the grain buckets so we can start soaking for tomorrow morning and then drop eggs off, and then we'll feed the turkeys. What's that mix? So this is a grain screening from Big Sky Organic. So they're all organic grains. They actually never really, uh, this might, they might have given us a few, no. They've never given us a feed tag because it's just screenings from the floor. Oh. So when you look at it, you know, from what I can tell, there's some barley in there. It looks like some cracked corn. That's just straw. Um, maybe some millet and amaranth, but it's a little different every time, depending on and what's in the season. you get it at a discount, I'm sure. Yeah, we get it at a discount as opposed to, this is a layer feed. That's just a layer mash, you know, your standard layer ration, basically. Yeah. Um, so, for the pigs, they just get the straight screenings. The chickens, and the turkeys get a mixture of either a turkey ration or a layer ration with the screenings because the screenings are cheaper. A guaranteed analysis, basically. They heard you, buddy. Yeah, they're uh, they're even bigger dinosaurs than the chickens. <laughs> this is our bourbon red flock. We have 17 this year. Last year they had the same amount and they ended up with only one tom. 
It's looking a lot better this year. I guess you win, buddy. You got them pretty happy. They don't even need the grain. No. And we're, we're off, definitely offering them more than they need because uh, the local hatchery that we get them from was about a month late on our delivery. They got backed up and they had a bad hatch. So they're younger than we would like them to be with the Thanksgiving deadline. Oh. You know, I, I know they had a lot going on at ABC Acres, but I never imagined they had their own school. Come on in. What's your name and what is this all about? Well, uh, my name is Sarah Southwell and I'm the executive director of Riverstone School. It is a uh, school for K through 12 right here in Hamilton, Montana. Hopefully someday to be available throughout the United States. And it is a, a new paradigm of education that hopes to create a new generation of very positive people. We believe that uh, children don't necessarily know the information or are ready for the information when they're tested. We believe that there is a genius inside of every child and it's a matter of giving them a safe place to learn that allows them to, uh, to welcome that genius being expressed in any way that it can be so that every child feels that they have potential and possibilities and they have a very bright future doing something fantastic. And just because they aren't, they aren't acing algebra right now doesn't mean that they're bad at math which is unfortunate what happens in our institutional education right now in the United States is that children tend to get the idea that they're bad at something just because they weren't ready for it right then. So we believe that the children should explore a subject, almost use the, uh, the outline as a map, and stay as long as they need to on certain islands and then move on and move quickly through others that they already know. What's the end goal for a child that comes here for you? What would you like to see? Oh, the end goal is for them to uh, be able to solve the problems of tomorrow, not solve the problems that have already occurred in our uh, existence. I think that unfortunately with our bubbles that we, that we fill in and all of the tests, the standardized tests that we take, our children simply are able to tell us how we solved problems in the past. And so I hope that children graduating from Riverstone School will have the tools to be able to find information that they need. If they have a question, how do you get it answered? And who do you go to for that? And those are very important things because throughout life, we don't necessarily retain all of the information that we learn. But when we want to learn more about it, we have to know where to go to get the answers. So I want them to be able to have that. All of the children here actually will have a qualitative analysis, a rubric system that uh, they will be able to apply for colleges if they would like to go on to that. They will have transcripts. Um, but we are not accredited. I don't plan on ever becoming accredited. Uh, we will have to hire only certified teachers if we do that. So if Bill Gates wants to come and teach my entrepreneurial class, I'm not going to turn him down. <laughs> just because he's not a certified teacher so um, yeah I think the children will will be very strong and empowered and they will be a new generation of positive thinkers people who believe in themselves and in the quality of others and I believe that that's lacking nowadays that we are not actually empowering our children to realize that they have their own uh, their own genius, their own abilities to make the world a really great place. And that's what we hope to do is actually change the world by changing the children's mind about themselves and the world. Maybe 
we can change our world around Maybe we can wage this fertile ground